right, let's go to the book of Acts, chapter 2. We have been in this series called Sent, and that is because the book of Acts is all about how we, as God's people, are sent into the world to share the gospel. Acts is often referred to as the Acts of the Apostles or the Acts of the Church, and we look at it that way. We also sometimes look at it as a book of law for the church, a lot of rules that we're supposed to look at and follow. And really, it's, it's kind of none of those things. The book of Acts was written by Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke, to be an explanation of what Jesus began to do and to teach. He says that in chapter 1, that this is what Jesus began to do and to teach. Jesus still lives in His church, in His people. He still teaches through His church and His people. He still serves, works, and heals through people in His church. And all of that uh, began while they were waiting in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit to empower them. And then the, the day of Pentecost came, 50 days after the Passover. And Peter and the other disciples get up and they start to preach the gospel to the people who were present. Thousands of people who had come to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. They're gathered at the temple. They get up and they start speaking by the power of the Holy Spirit. And as they do, the people start asking questions. They ask questions like, what does all this mean? They're speaking in tongues. They're speaking my language. They're, they're preaching a gospel about Jesus and saying He was raised from the dead. What does all this mean? And we talked the last couple of weeks about what that means for them. For them it meant that they needed to repent and to come back to the Lord. That's what repent means. To turn their hearts and minds back to the Lord. To be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins. It means the same thing for us today. And then uh, we get to the verses that we're looking at this morning. After they ask the questions, what does it mean? After they ask the question, so what are we supposed to do about our sin? We were part of crucifying Jesus. We shouted crucify Him. What do we do about that? And after Peter has said, you need to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, that's what they did. 3,000 people that day, thousands more in the weeks that followed. Our what do we do is the same, and we talked about that last week. We have, like them, at times rebelled against the will of God. We have, at times, lived lives that were sinful, that were disobedient, that lacked faith, where we made huge, big mistakes. And what do we do when that's the case? The same extension of grace that was to them is to us today. And what we do is we change our hearts, we change our minds, we repent, and we turn back to God, and we're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, and we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He says, this promise is for you and for all your children and for all those who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And as those thousands of people walked into the water that day, sinners, and walked out of the water that day, saved, forgiven, and free, their lives changed forever. All of this is tied up in the resurrection of Jesus. Today we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, uh, also known as Easter, and it's all about the power of Jesus to overcome the grave and the power of Jesus to overcome our sin and the power of Jesus to bring us into a whole new life and walk with God. And as we begin that new life, everything changes. So that's what I want to look at this morning. We're going to read Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 41, and then we'll start looking at some of these things that happen. In fact, actually, I'm going to go back. No, I'm going to start in 41. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved." 
We read this passage often and it just kind of gets us extremely excited because we look at the picture of the church and what they were doing and how they lived and how they responded. And we look at it and maybe we see some things that are a lot like the way we felt when we first became Christians. Maybe they're, they're like uh, times we have in our memories of, of when we were new and young Christians and we're out there serving and we're excited and, and we're, we're having fellowship with people all the time. Uh, Pre-COVID, maybe you go to, to pre-COVID things when uh, fellowship was a lot more often and classes were a lot more often and, and you got to go out and serve people not just by yourself but together with your brothers and sisters in Christ and you miss that and you long for that and you read this passage and you just go, that, that's what I signed up for. I signed up to be a part of that community that is constantly serving, constantly loving, constantly encouraging and constantly together in the word and the work of of God. You can see in these verses why Luke said it the way he did, that the church is Jesus still teaching, still doing, still ministering, because you see it in these words. So we're going to look at this today, just this brief passage, at what it looks like to be a resurrected people of God. Because this is Resurrection Day, and it means something that Jesus still lives. It means something that He rose from the grave, and it means something to the way that you and I live out our Christian faith. It changes everything in part because it's born of joy. And this is where I think we have to start. When they responded to the gospel, they responded in repentance, but they didn't respond in a repentance that was based on, I broke a law, I'm being punished, and I want to get out of trouble. Okay, Jesus is not just your bell bondsman. Jesus is your Lord and Savior. He's your Redeemer. He's the one who restores your love and your relationship with God. He restores your heart, your mind, and your soul. And that brings a peace that passes understanding, Paul says, and it brings a joy that just should bubble up and fill up our souls and our life. And I think if you look at Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47, even though the word joy is never mentioned, Joy just oozes out of this passage. Uh, law doesn't do that, does it? Law doesn't have a way of making us feel awesome about the laws. When I'm driving down the road, there are all kinds of laws. And there are the laws that I like, and there are laws that I don't like. I like laws that keep us in our lane, okay? I like laws that say that you ought to use your blinker because that way we know what's going on, we know what your intentions are, and we're less likely to run into each other. It doesn't bring me joy when you put on your blinker, though, right? You obey the law, you fulfill the law, it helps us, it's useful, but it doesn't bring me joy, Law doesn't really do that. There are laws I don't like. Uh, laws like uh, 75 miles an hour, you know. I might, if my vehicle were one that would get better gas mileage when it goes faster, instead of watching the needle start to go down around 80 miles an hour, then I would love to just be able to drive as fast as I want. That would bring me joy, or at least happiness. But, you know, laws that say I have to slow down to 35, 45 miles an hour... I don't enjoy them all that much. But they're there, and they're there for our protection, and, and they can be good and useful and helpful and things like that and help us avoid problems. But they don't, they don't bring us joy. The joy that we see in them is not because they had been nailed to the pew, beat over the head with a particular scripture. You might think that if you look at what Peter said to them. He convicts them of their sin, and the Spirit convicts them of their sin. But their joy was born in their redemption, was born in their forgiveness. They were excited, they were joyful, they were loving, they were kind, they were generous. And that is one of those things that is born out of their new freedom in Christ. They had been set free. And like people coming out of Auschwitz or a slave having their chains broken off and set free. They are loving and kind and happy and generous because they're excited, because their joy has been restored, because they are set free by the sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus Christ, by the Spirit that it now has come to live within them because they are children of God. That doesn't happen when we start to treat 
the book of Acts like a law book. Like we look at the book of Acts so that we can figure out, here's what I can legally do and illegally not do as a Christian. Are there things in the book of Acts that teach us how to, how to be the church and with some of the things uh, that, we, that we ought to be doing as a church? Yeah, there are some practical things in the book of Acts. How do you deal with this problem? How do you deal with this problem? There are also some things just... Uh, examples of, of what not to do. Ananias and Sapphira, we learn pretty well, don't you be lying to the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, so there are some things, there are warnings even in the book of Acts, but that's still not what the book of Acts is. The book of Acts is what Jesus began to do and to teach. And so as we look at it, we're looking at history a history that's meant to inform us about what the early church was like, about what Jesus was like as he worked through that church, about what the Holy Spirit does and why he does what he does, about who we are in Christ. It's meant to inform us. It's meant to inspire us. It's meant to empower us to do the Lord's work. And as it does, it brings us joy. Because we start to see in that story of the early church and as Jesus worked through it, who we really are and who we want and aspire to be. A people that live like these verses. I've known so many Christians who've looked at this, whether they were new Christians or old, and they look at that and they just go, that's, that's the kind of church I want to be a part of. That's where I want to go. That's where I want to worship. Those are the people that I want to know. Let me challenge you this way. If that's the church that you want to be in, then that's the church that you need to be. Don't go looking for a church that is that. Become the church that is that. Because that's really what the book of Acts is all about. It's not about going out and looking for something that already exists in a body. It's about us becoming that body of Christ. And wherever the Holy Spirit is and however He works, He will equip and empower us to be that church. And the book of Acts shows us so many ways in which that is true. Brothers and sisters in Christ in the first century going all over their world. And as they went, they preached the gospel, they lived the gospel, they shared the gospel by the Holy Spirit, and they set people free to serve the Lord and to love their neighbor as He wants us to do. That's what it means when it says that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We are set free from our mistakes, set free from our sins, set free from all the expectations of the world to live out the life that God called us to. And that's why we see them do what they did in Acts 2, 42 to 47. They had been set free, and they wanted to live that life of love and of joy and excitement. Now, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 16, that you can know a tree by its fruit. And what he means by that is, if you really want to know what somebody's about, you just look at the way that they live and look at what they produce. If they produce a lot of fighting and anger and, and constant division, then you know what kind of a person they are. They're bitter, they're angry, and they're divisive. If they're a person, uh, well, you, here, let me put it this way. I often look at things, uh, if, if a person is in trouble every single place they ever go, they're in trouble in their marriage, they're in trouble at work, they're in trouble at school, they're in trouble here, they're in trouble there, they're in trouble even when they just go to the grocery store, they're in trouble when they go to the gas station, then you know something because you look, or I look, at the common denominators. If there is trouble everywhere someone goes, there's a good chance they are the center of that trouble. Now, that can be for a few different reasons. It may be that they're a troublemaker, and they are just divisive and bitter and angry, and they cause problems everywhere they go. It can also be that they're acting like Jesus, and they're loving people, and they're loving people that other people don't approve of them uh, actually caring for, and they're being too nice to people, or they're being too, uh, too convicted about what's right and what's wrong, and that rubs people the wrong way, but they're doing it in a loving way, they're doing it in a convicting way, though. Jesus did that, and Jesus got in trouble. He was a common denominator. It's not always a bad thing, but you look at common denominators. You look at what kind of an environment people create. You look at how they leave the world behind 
at the end of their life. Whether that is a celebration of their life or a celebration that, whew, we're glad they're gone. You don't see that very often, but I've been to that funeral, and that's a sad story. You know a tree by its fruit. He looked at the Pharisees and says, you know what they're like. You know what's really in their heart because all that follows them around is bitterness, judgment, abuse. So you know what kind of a tree they are. You look at people's fruit. Well, what was their fruit? Let's look back at the passage. Their fruit started with verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. So one of their fruits was uh, the fruit of their joy, the fruit of their new life, the fruit of their decision to follow Jesus was that they became people who were very devoted to the apostles' teaching. They wanted to know, who is this Jesus even more than what I knew when I decided to follow him? What else was he? Who else is he? What does he want me to live like? How does he want me to treat people? What does it mean to love the Lord, thy God, with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love thy neighbor as, as thyself? And so they listened, and they talked about with each other. They studied together the apostles' teaching. What did these eyewitnesses see? They looked at the Gospels. They looked at how Jesus lived and walked and talked among us with the goal of being more like him. And they were devoted to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. As they devoted themselves to the Word, that brought about a fruit of a devotion to one another. Fellowship wasn't just meals together, but fellowship definitely was meals together. You notice the breaking of bread. And there is, has been for a long time a discussion, not really strong enough to be a debate, but a discussion of whether or not this devotion to the breaking of bread is talking about the Lord's Supper, that we eat together and break the bread together and renew our commitment and, and reinforce our covenant with God, recommit ourselves to it each week. Is that talking about that or is that talking about meals in the home and just, just fellowship as we come together, whether it's in the room down the hall or in our living rooms or at McDonald's, you know, to the fellowship of brothers and sisters in Christ. And here's what I'm going to tell you about this discussion. Is it the Lord's Supper or is it breaking bread at the table of fellowship? Yes. I believe it's yes. The phrase is used for both things in the New Testament. It's used for both things in the, just in the book of Acts. And so I think the answer is yes, that the fruit of the joy that we find in Jesus Christ, a gratitude for who He is and what He's done, and for the brothers and sisters we have in Christ who encourage us, strengthen us, and help us to live this life, we devote ourselves to a constant fellowship with one another because a devotion to fellowship is a devotion to to a person and persons. They weren't just devoted to an event of fellowship. They were devoted to one another. We go into the water alone. We come out of the water in a family, in a community of Christ. And we devote ourselves and commit ourselves to building each other up, to helping each other out, to serving one another, to encouraging one another, because we love each other, because God's love has brought that into our hearts by His Spirit. That strangers from all different kinds of backgrounds, with all different kinds of interests, maybe even as we uh, are connecting with folks around the world, uh, people from different cultures and languages and, and countries even, we're devoted to one another. And that's why I have these pictures that are back up here. Uh, these are from my Google Photos album. And I went looking for just different pictures of, of events I remember in the past of brothers and sisters enjoying fellowship. And so I've got a few here that I want to share with you. This first one up in here at the very left, this is from our last trip uh, from this church to Guatemala City. And this is at a sister named Susie in the blue shirt here uh, that says, Be no, that's Roberto. Uh, she has the lighter, that's kind of funny. Uh, she has the lighter shirt with the long hair. Sorry, didn't, I looked over my glasses and I can't see over my glasses. Uh, but this lady here is Susie and Susie is a lady in Guatemala City who sells fruits and vegetables to support, she's a single mom, to support her family. She has a son and a daughter. But what she didn't have was good housing. Uh, she did not have indoor plumbing. She did not have a bathroom at all. And her house was kind of a, an open-ended 
shack. Not a lean-to, it was better and bigger than that, but, but not a whole lot made from scraps. We decided she needed, because she was in a desperate situation, she needed a, uh, a bathroom and a shower. And, and so this church, members in this church, got together and gave the money to do that because that's the fruit of a loving people who care about brothers and sisters in Christ around the world, whether they've even ever really met them and gotten to know them all that well or not, because we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we got that money together so that we could get her. Uh, originally, all they were asking for was to be able to get for the outhouse built. Well, it got bigger than that. Next thing you know, that had grown into an enclosed restroom. And so we were able to get enough to get all of that done, dug and, and enclosed the restroom. And then a church in Tennessee, in Franklin, Tennessee, uh, who also make mission trips down to Guatemala City, they got involved and, and uh, uh, upgraded the enclosure of this outhouse. It's not an outhouse. This is a full restroom with plumbing and then decided, you know, why don't we go ahead and get some more materials and just finish off the rest of her small home. Now she has a good uh, cinder, it's a cinder block concrete home with a metal roof. By American standards, uh, you might say uh, that it is a humble home, but I will tell you it is a mansion to Susie and it's awesome when you walk into it if you know what was there before. Brothers and sisters in Christ devoted to one another. Make those kinds of sacrifices. They were so in awe in the first century of what God was doing that it changed the way they were doing. They saw the Holy Spirit work with wonders and signs and miracles showing that Jesus was who He said He was and the church was to be what He said it was to be. And so when He called them to generosity and called them to self-sacrifice, they said, sign me up. And they just started doing it. And they were together. And they shared with one another whatever was, was needed. And so we shared with Susie. And other Christians from Tennessee jumped in and shared with Susie and built her not just a restroom, but a whole house. Refurbished what she had, closed it in. And it was awesome to go and to see. This is when we, we were visiting on the last trip so that the people who had been there before and those who hadn't could go and see the good that was done when people are being like Jesus to see the fruit that was there in this lower picture this is a, a picture from probably 1995 I believe this is the summer of 95 in Perm, Russia uh, the lady in red is the wife of the man who is now the preacher at the church in Perm that started preaching there a little while after we left those are a mix of Americans and Russians all around the table in fact, this lady in the blue shirt is a Russian. Oh, here's, here's Valeri. He's the preacher. And this is uh, a teacher in Oklahoma now who is married to an American and serves in the church uh, in Oklahoma. There are people in this picture all around that table from America and from Russia. And they're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And they're sitting around. And I always thought this was cool. The Russian Christians loved the idea of no matter how many people were going to be around that table, we're going to turn these tables into one table because we're one family. And I always thought that had a great gospel metaphor in it. We are at one table because we are one family. And the gospel has quite literally gone around the world because of some of the people, most of the people, if not all of the people in this picture because that's the fruit of a life changed by the Spirit of God. And people who were once parts of countries that were at, on edge and in a cold war with each other can gather around the table in Christian fellowship and know nothing but love and joy and the peace of the Holy Spirit. God does that. He did that in, at Pentecost. He does that in the church today. He brings people together who might never have been together in any other way. This other picture is from this week. The man on the left you recognize, that is Pio Escobedo, and he is baptizing a woman in uh, Mexico, in Nuevo Leon, Mexico. Pio, an awesome brother in Christ who preaches the gospel and has been able to do so for so many years in part because of the generosity and love of this church wanting to see people in Mexico know the gospel of Christ.
And so you have sacrificed as they sacrificed. Some of you have sold things to be able to give to that mission work, just as they sold things to see that their brothers and sisters in Christ had what they needed. We furnished small, tiny houses. We have furnished houses for healing in Abilene. We have fed people and clothed people and homed people and hoteled people. We have done what Jesus is called to do. But let me tell you this, a resurrected people doesn't quit and a resurrected people doesn't die again. We are going to keep doing that. And we are going to be a people of the resurrection like they were. That no matter who stands up in the way, no matter what cultural shifts try to stand in our way, no matter what the devil throws at us, we are going to be a people who love each other so much we will give it all up if we have to to make sure that people know life in Christ. This is who they were in the first century. This is who we aim to be in the 21st century so that if the Lord hasn't come just yet in the 31st, there are people here at 900 Early Boulevard or somewhere they've had to move to get more space praising God, loving their neighbors, and sharing the gospel with their neighbors and friends and all who will hear. The fruit of their life was also this. Not only did they sacrifice, but they got together. I know that's one of the things that's been very difficult in the last year, although we have made ways. We've been at the park. We have been outside. We have done all kinds of things. And so if, if you haven't been together in the last year, that has been, quite honestly, most of the time, your choice, not ours. We have made those opportunities possible. And even if they were online and you didn't like it, the possibility was there, wasn't it? A resurrected people doesn't matter how you get together. It matters that you get together. And if it has to be online, in the park, in the parking lot, or, or wherever, we're going to do it, right? That's what resurrected people do because they understand all too well that they never want to go back to the loneliness of being lost. And they don't want anyone else to feel that way either. And so we make those opportunities. It's always like in the parable of the sower. We scatter the seed and it either grows or it doesn't. But we're going to keep scattering that seed. They shared life. They also shared their homes together. This is something that as we... Uh, emerge uh, as a commercial I've heard way too many times in the last week on the radio as we emerge from this post-COVID world as we do we do not need to go back to normal normal was overrated normal was not having people in our homes normal was being too private to be loving and kind and hospitable it was hiding when the doorbell rings for some of you it was not answering the phone for some of you. The post-COVID world, I don't care about. The, what I care about is the post-Pentecost world. In the post-Pentecost world, you don't shut your door to your neighbor. You show hospitality. You show kindness. You have people over. You have fellowship with one another. If you feel like, well, I just don't know about having people in my home, fine, go have them somewhere else. Bring them up here to the building, the fellowship hall. Go to McDonald's together. But you share life and you show hospitality. And, uh, well, I'm going to backtrack. Get them into your house. If you've got to change the way you live to follow Christ, well, actually, you do have to change the way you live to follow Christ. That's not too much to ask. Start being hospitable. It's a command of the Word of God anyway, right? Open your home to one another because opening your home is opening your heart. And finally, do this with gladness and sincerity. That's who they were. They were glad to do it. It was genuine. It was sincere. It was, to use a word we use more often nowadays, it was authentic. Nothing faked, nothing plastic, only real. Love people gladly and from the heart. And that may change, or that may require a rewiring of your mind and your heart about the way you do things. It may require that you live differently after Jesus than you did before Jesus. That's called repentance, so that's part of the deal, right? You said yes to that already. So do it with gladness and sincerity. And that'll bring you to the next thing that they did. They praised God. So this doesn't come out of law, and it doesn't come out of guilt. It comes out of joy. It comes out of gladness. It comes out of I want to be like Jesus to people. 
And I'm going to let God take every opportunity in my life that comes. And I want to love people, serve people, and be Jesus to people because that's what a resurrected people of God do. When we do this, we resurrect something other than just our life. God resurrects something other than just our eternity. He restores hope. We are a people who are to be about the mission of resurrecting hope for people. We used to say, uh, if we will do what they did, we'll get what they got. That's how we would interpret the book of Acts. If we'll, just, if we'll meet in homes, if we will break bread, if we will do this every week, if we will meet every day, if we do those things, then we'll get what they got. I don't think that's actually quite accurate enough. If we do what they did, maybe we'll get what they got. Maybe we won't. Maybe we can meet every single day and we still don't grow. That happens in churches all over the world. It happens in groups all over the world. Maybe we will. Maybe we won't. Because the, the true power in their example, the true power in the resurrection people of God in Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47 is this. It's not that if we do what they did, we'll get what they got. It's that if we will become what they were, we will get what they got. And what they were was a believing, loving, serving, sacrificing, praising people of God. They were people who let the Holy Spirit and the gospel not just live within them, but live through them and out to other people. They proved the love of Christ by showing the love of Christ's people. And in that way, they enjoyed the favor of all the people. And people were being added by the Lord to the church every single day. I would love to see that again. I long to see that again. It gives me goosebumps and it kind of makes me choke up some because I want to see that again. But I don't believe it comes through a rigid recitation of a first century church schedule. I believe it comes through a spirit-filled, a spirit-inspired, a spirit-empowered resurrection of what it means to be the church be the church living, the church loving, the church serving, the church on mission in the world. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ that went before us and gave us such an incredible and inspiring example of what it means to be your body. And Father, we pray that Christ will live in us and through us and inspire us to go out and lead us out into the world to bring people to you. Father, we pray that we will be humble, loving, and kind. We pray that you will teach us to be more like your Son every single day so that more come to your Son every single day. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.